before we get started, um, can you hear me? Are the microphones on? Uh, in addition to acknowledging the presence of Bella Rifshin, who's back for her first appearance in the halls of the PCOB, <laughs> um, we have with us at the council's table Robert Burns. Robert Burns has been with us for a very long time. Uh, I've, I've been associated with Bob since early days at the SEC, in the 90s at the SEC. Uh, he has a very long, very distinguished career in the general counsel's office in the Co Division of Corporation Finance at the SEC and here. And uh, he has done an immense amount of public good over a long and distinguished career. And when he, when he in fact, decides to retire, which I understand is imminent, <laughs> it may be before we have another open meeting, another rules proposal, I'd like to say that we're all going to miss you. Um, you've been a great colleague and a great friend and a great source of wisdom. Thank you very much. Um, this is a public meeting. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. This is a public, an open meeting of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, May 7th, 2013. I want to welcome all of you who have joined us today, both in person and listening to the webcast of the meeting. Today, the board will consider a recommendation to propose a new auditing standard that would supersede the board's interim standard on related parties and related amendments to the board's standards. And before we proceed with the agenda, I want to note for the record that all board members are present. The first and only order of business today before the board in this meeting is a staff recommendation that the board repropose an auditing standard on related parties. And to present the staff's recommendation on this agenda item, I will turn over the meeting over to our chief auditor, Martin Bauman. Mr. Bauman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, in fact, we are pleased this morning to recommend that the board repropose for public comment an auditing standard entitled Related Parties, Amendments to Existing Standards Regarding Significant Unusual Transactions, and other amendments, including amendments that would require the auditor to obtain an understanding of a company's financial relationships with its executive officers. Related party transactions have been contributing factors in numerous prominent financial reporting frauds over the last few decades. Financial reporting frauds also have involved significant unusual transactions, as well as in some cases, a company's financial relationships and transactions with its executive officers. Corporate scandals involving these areas have had serious adverse economic consequences including significant losses for investors and the loss of many jobs for employees. Improving audit quality in these critical areas will protect the interests of investors and further the public interest in the preparation of informative, accurate, and independent audit reports. The reproposed standard and amendments are, in are intended to enhance the board's auditing standards in the following three areas. First, the auditor's evaluation of a company's identification of, accounting for, and disclosure of relationships and transactions between the company and its related parties. Second, the auditor's identification and evaluation of a company's significant unusual transactions. And third, the auditor's understanding of a company's financial relationships and transactions with its executive officers. The reproposed standard, if ultimately adopted by the board, would supersede the board's existing auditing standard, AU Section 334, on related parties. I'll turn it over to the project team to walk through the reproposed standard and amendments and the changes from the original proposal in more detail. Before I do so, I'd like to note that the reproposal contains a discussion of economic considerations regarding the reproposed standard and amendments. That discussion contains numerous questions seeking input from commenters on such matters. That section is intended solic to solicit input to assist the staff in completing its economic analysis, particularly with respect to the applicability of the reproposal to audits of emerging growth companies. Greg Skates, Brian Degano, and Nick Grillo will provide further details about this reproposal. <clears throat> Before I turn it over to them, I'd like to thank the team for their extraordinary effort in the development of this reproposal. I'd also like to recognize the other people who've made substantial contributions to the project. First, I'd like to thank Karen Burgess, Michael Gerbett, and Leslie Givers 
in the Office of the Chief Auditor, Andres Vanelli and Morris Mittler in the Office of Research and Analysis, and Bob Burns in the Office of General Counsel for their assistance and thoughtful insights. And like you, I hope Bob Burns stays around here before our next <laughs> open meeting and we have our next uh, proposal before the board. Second, I appreciate the contributions of our colleagues in the other divisions of the PCOB, including inspections and enforcement. And finally, I'd like to thank the staff of the Securities and Exchange Commission who provided timely and helpful assistance and advice. I'll now turn it over to Greg, Brian, and Nick to further present our recommendation. Greg? Thank you, Marty. The board undertook this project as several factors indicate a need for improvement to the existing standards. The board <coughs> developed the proposed standard and amendments in light of the magnitude and number of financial reporting frauds <coughs> involving public companies' relationships and transactions with related parties, significant unusual transactions, and financial relationships and transactions with its executive officers. The board's proposals also, I've been informed by observations from the PCOB's oversight activities, which includes discussions with the board's standing advisory group and international developments. Both the auditor and the investor benefit from a comprehensive and consistent examination of these critical areas, not only because of the risk of, of material misstatement due to fraud, but also because these transactions, due to their nature, pose significant risk of material misstatements due to error. The original proposal back in February of 2012 addressed these critical areas contemporaneously because the board, because the auditor's efforts in these areas complement each other. For example, focusing the auditor's identification and evaluation of significant unusual transactions can assist the auditor in identifying related party transactions that management has not previously disclosed to the auditor. Also, performing procedures to obtain an understanding of a company's financial relationships and transactions with its, its executive officers can assist the auditor in identifying undisclosed related party transactions. The board issued the original proposal, as I mentioned, back in February, on February 28, 2012, and received 37 comment letters. The proposal was also discussed at the board's standing advisory group meeting on May 17th. In general, commenters were supportive of the board's efforts to improve the existing auditing standards in, this, in these areas. However, commenters did provide suggestions on improving the original proposal. The standard and amendments have been revised in several areas in response to these comments. <coughs> By reproposing the standard and amendments, commenters will have an opportunity once again to provide input regarding the changes that we're proposing today. The reproposal's approach for promoting audit quality in these critical areas considers how to balance improving the effectiveness of the auditing standards while av avoiding any unnecessary costs. The reproposal is requesting comment on the potential economic considerations of the reproposed standard and amendments. Subsequent to the proposal, subsequent to the publication of the proposal back in February of 2012, the Jobs Act was enacted. Pursuant to the Jobs Act, any rules adopted by the board subsequent to April 5th, 2012 do not apply to the audits of emerging growth companies unless the SEC determines that the application of such additional requirements is necessary or appropriate in the public interest after considering the protection of investors and whether the action will promote efficiency, competition, and capital formation. The reproposal specifically requests commenters' views regard, regarding considerations re raised by the JOBS Act, including the application of the reproposed standard and amendments to the audits of emerging growth companies. The reproposal specifically requests comments, including empirical data regarding the impact of the reproposed standard and amendments on investor protection and whether the application of the reproposed standard and amendments would promote efficiency, competition, and capital formation. In addition, the Dodd-Frank Act gave the board oversight of the audits of brokers and dealers registered with the SEC. Similar to the original, original proposal back in February of 2012, the reproposal requests comments from auditors of brokers and dealers 
and others regarding the appropriateness of the reproposed standard and amendments for audits of brokers and dealers. Brian Degano and Nick Grillo will now discuss uh, several of the significant changes in the reproposed standard and amendments in additional detail. Brian will be will be discussing the reproposed standard on related parties, and Nick will be discussing the reproposed amendments. Now I'll turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> The reproposed standard would strengthen existing auditor performance requirements regarding a company's relationships and transactions with its related parties. The reproposed standard would require that an auditor perform specific procedures to obtain an understanding of the company's relationships and transactions with its related parties, perform specific procedures for related party transactions that require disclosure in the financial statements or that are determined to be a significant risk and to perform specific procedures if the auditor determines that a related party or relationship or transaction with a related party previously undisclosed to the auditor exists. The reproposed standard would also require that the auditor evaluate whether the company has properly identified its related parties and relationships and transactions with related parties, and that the auditor communicate to the audit committee the auditor's evaluation of the company's identification of, accounting for, and disclosure of its relationships and transactions with its related parties. The reproposed standard reflects several clarifying changes and improvements in response to the comments we received, and I'd like to describe three of those changes. First, some commenters requested clarification regarding the relationship of the proposed standard and the board's risk assessment standards. In response, the reproposed standard reflects several revisions to better integrate the proposed requirements with the requirements of the risk assessment standards. For example, the revisions clarify that the specific risk assessment procedures required by the reproposed standard are performed in conjunction with the risk assessment procedures performed pursuant to auditing standard number 12. Second, some commenters suggested that the board clarify the auditor's responsibility to perform procedures to identify the company's related parties. In response, the reproposed standard has been revised to require the auditor to evaluate whether the company has properly identified the related parties and relationships and transactions with its related parties. The reproposed standard would also note that evaluating whether a company has properly identified its related parties and relationships and transactions with its related parties involves more than assessing the process used by the company and that this evaluation requires the auditor to perform procedures to test the accuracy and completeness of the related parties and relationships and transactions with related parties identified by the company. In the staff's view, these clarifications recognize that the company is responsible for the preparation of its financial statements, including, in the first instance, the identification of the company's related parties, and that the auditor begins the audit with information obtained from the company. Thirdly, several commenters suggested that the proposed standard should allow more room for the use of auditor judgment. In response, the reproposed standard reflects several revisions, including removing the requirement that each related party transaction previously undisclosed to the auditor by management be treated as a significant risk, and clarifying that the auditor ex exercises discretion in making inquiries of certain individuals within the company regarding the company's relationships and transactions with its related parties. I'll now turn it over to Nick, who will discuss the reproposed amendments. Nick. Thank you. In addition to the proposed standard, the original proposal included amendments intended to strengthen the auditor's identification and evaluation of a company's significant unusual transactions. The proposed amendments described a significant unusual transaction as a significant transaction that is outside the normal course of business for the company or that otherwise appears to be unusual due to its timing, size, or nature. The reproposed amendments regarding significant unusual transactions are designed to, among other things, improve the auditor's identification of significant unusual transactions, enhance the auditor's evaluation of whether the business purpose or lack thereof indicates that they may have been entered into to engage in fraudulent financial reporting or to conceal misappropriation of assets, and enhance the auditor's evaluation of whether such transactions have been appropriately accounted for and adequately disclosed in the company's financial statements. In response to comments received, the reproposed amendments reflect certain changes intended to enhance the linkage between the reproposed standard and the reproposed amendments. For example, 
The revisions to the reproposed amendments include several additional references which clarify that the auditor should take into account information that indicates that related parties or relationships or transactions with related parties previously undisclosed to the auditor might exist when identifying significant unusual transactions. The original proposal also included other amendments intended to complement the proposals with respect to related party transactions and significant unusual transactions. One such amendment addressed the auditor's consideration of a company's financial relationships and transactions with its executive officers. The original proposal included these amendments as executive officers are in a unique position to influence a company's financial statement accounting and disclosures. A company's financial relationships and transactions with its executive officers can create incentives and pressures which can result in risks of material misstatement. While many commenters supported the proposed amendments in this area, some commenters did not and expressed concerns such as that the proposed amendments might result in auditors influencing the design of compensation arrangements with executive officers. Other commenters expressed concern that the proposed amendments might impair auditor independence. In response to these concerns, the reproposed amendments include revisions that clarify that the auditor's procedures in this area would be performed as part of the auditor's risk assessment process. The auditor's risk assessment procedures are performed to identify and assess risk of material misstatement of the financial statements and develop responses to those risks. Consistent with the requirements of the risk assessment process, these procedures would not require the auditor to make any determination regarding the reasonableness of or any recommendations regarding compensation arrangements. In closing, the reproposal includes specific questions for which we are seeking input from commenters. We would also encourage comments from interested parties on all aspects of the release, including topics for which we have not posed specific questions. The staff recommends that the board issue the reproposed auditing standard and amendments for a public comment period ending July 8, 2013. This concludes our remarks. We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you all for that summary of the proposed standard and the amendments before us. And, and thank you for the work uh, that you've done to enable us to consider um, the, these, this reproposal and your consideration of the comments we received on our February 2012 proposal and the work you did to craft uh, or release a response to improve uh, the, the proposal. Related party transactions and significant in transactions are outside the normal course of business that, that are outside the normal course of business have been, as you say, a contributing factor in numerous prominent financial reporting frauds over the decades. Our reproposing release mentions a skein of financial reporting failures in this area that have resulted in significant investor losses as well as the loss of jobs at affected companies. The newspapers, though, are replete even now with revelations of insider and significant unusual transactions that in light of day only serve to delay the day of reckoning with the markets. And as is often the case, the market reckoning comes at great cost to investors. The proposal before the board today would update and strengthen audit procedures in these critical areas. Reliable information, of course, undergirds the market confidence and capital formation process. Once such transactions as these are subjected to enhanced focus and appropriate scrutiny, auditors are able reliably to differentiate between those transactions that have questionable business utility and those that are legitimate mechanisms to provide for financing or asset disposition, and that lies at the heart of this reproposal. The focus and security, and the focus and scrutiny uh, that, are, that are sought here can help to avert the corporate failures and the job losses we read about all too often once it's too late to do anything. As with the February 2012 proposal, we have been mindful to build on our existing risk assessment standards to align this proposal with those concepts. This proposal advances that effort with further refinements. The changes reflect our considered study of ways to make audits more efficient, more effective, and integrated with the overall audit approach. We'll be seeking comment on any aspect of the proposal, including 
As Marty said, the potential economic implications of the proposal. I look forward to the, com the public comment on this proposal and to the statements of my colleagues on the board. With that, I'll recognize uh, Board Member Franzel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would also like to thank uh, the Office of the Chief Auditor, Marty, Brian, Greg, Nicholas, and everybody else who worked on this, this very fine project. Um, I support today's issuance of the release of the reproposed auditing standards on related parties and the amendments regarding significant unusual transactions and a company's financial relationships and transactions with executive officers. This is a very lengthy release, but it is filled with substance, and so I hope that members of the public uh, will take the time uh, to read this release and respond uh, to the very good questions that have been added to it. Uh, the reproposal and amendments deal with critical areas that compose risks of material misstatements of companies' financial statements due to error or fraud. Uh, as the staff have noted, related party transactions have been contributing factors in numerous financial reporting frauds over the last few decades. Financial reporting frauds have also involved significant transactions that are outside the normal course of business or that are unusual due to their timing, size, or nature, which we refer to as significant unusual transactions uh, in this proposal. Finally, risk to financial reporting can result from a company's financial relationships and transactions with its executive officers. The requirements contained in the reproposal and amendments should sharpen the auditor's focus on these areas uh, that experience has shown present risk of harm to investors, uh, areas where existing standards provide wide latitude uh, for auditors. Uh, the reproposed standard and amendments are intended to raise the minimum threshold of audit performance across these risky areas. And today's release explains why existing auditing standards should be enhanced in these areas to promote consistent audit quality and investor protection. Uh, Marty and the staff did a very good job summarizing the merits of this proposal as well as the substance of the proposal, uh, so I won't repeat those details in my own remarks, but just support the remarks that the staff made uh, in this regard. Uh, the release also contains a series of questions organized by topic and designed to solicit comments from interested parties uh, on particular aspects of the reproposal. I encourage interested parties to comment on the reproposal and amendments, including the changes that were made to the original proposal in response to comments that were received, uh, as well as on the broad and specific economic considerations costs and benefits uh, related to the reproposed requirements, including audits of emerging growth companies. Again, I want to thank uh, Marty and the staff for their excellent work on this. I look forward to receiving <coughs> public comments and seeing this project uh, to completion. Thank you. Board Member Jay Hanson. Thank you and good morning. By proposing a new standard today on related parties and amendments regarding significant and unusual transactions and a company's financial relationship with uh, and transactions with executive officers, we are taking an important step to further the PCOB's mission of investor protection. The relationships and transactions addressed by the standard and amendments we are proposing today present high risks of financial misstatement and have proven in the past to be vehicles for fraud. Given their importance, it's not surprising that la la the proposal last year to enhance auditing requirements in these areas was well received. Commenters generally supported the project and the proposed enhancements to existing standards. Nevertheless, some commenters offered suggestions for improvement, and we have considered these comments carefully. Although we've made a number of changes and clarifications, our overall approach has not changed. The standard on related parties is intended to strengthen the existing audit procedures for identifying, assessing, and responding to the risk of material misstatement associated with the company's related party transactions. In complementing this uh, uh, proposed standard are the proposed amendments to strengthen the auditor's identification and evaluation of significant unusual transactions, along with comments addressing related matters such as transactions with uh, executive officers. Uh, as the staff has noted, um, we've, we've made some changes as a result of the comments. I'll just uh, make a couple comments on those. Uh, the the uh, main comment about inter better integrating the um, uh, proposed standard with the uh, board's existing risk assessment standards, including the clarifying that the risk assessment procedures performed to obtain an understanding of the companies uh, of the company with its related parties are performed in conjunction with the risk assessment uh, procedures uh, pursuant to AS12. This should facilitate a comprehensive and thorough risk assessment, leading to an appropriate audit procedure procedures in an efficient manner. 
Uh, and second, the, uh, the points made about uh, allowing more room for auditor judgment, including uh, the de decision about which individuals to uh, uh, pursue um, uh, inquiries of related to the company's related party transactions, and whether uh, additional procedures are necessary for all um, previously undisclosed um, related party transactions. I think those are good additions. On the comments related to the um, uh, f uh, companies' financial relationships and transactions with executive officers, uh, there were concerns expressed, obviously, as been, has been noted. And um, uh, in practice today, I observe that uh, aud auditors already are reviewing those transac uh, transactions and agreements for the proper accounting for such things as stock options, other share-based payments, and bonus arrangements. But in response to the concerns expressed, the board has clarified that the uh, uh, procedures are part of the auditor's risk assessment process, focusing on a small group of executives who are in a position to influence the company's accounting and financial statements and do not require the auditor make any determination about the reasonableness of the company's compensation arrangements with its executive officers. Uh, finally, I want to say a few things about the economic analysis. Uh, although the board has always considered economic analysis uh, and potential costs in the pro process of issuing new standards, we had already begun work on, on expanding our analysis in early 2012, uh, considering whether more could be done to understand the potential economic consequences, positive and negative, of the board standard setting activities. As others have noted, the Jobs Act in 2012 uh, created uh, an additional requirement relative to emerging growth companies and and, uh, and the uh, need for the SEC to determine whether the application of such additional requirements is necessary or appropriate in the public interest after considering the protection of investors and whether the action will promote efficiency, competition, and capital formation. Um, the reproposed amendments um, uh, in standard, if adopted, will be the first issued by the board since the enactment of the JOBS Act and uh, that will require um, the, the auditor to actually perform additional procedures. The economic analysis and Jobs Act discussions in the release, therefore, an attempt at gathering and conveying information relevant to the evaluation by the board of the potential effects of requiring such new audit procedures. We are eager to receive the input both in the substance of the economic analysis questions we have proposed as well as uh, on our still developing economic analysis process. The related parties standard in particular is going to present challenges in connection with the Jobs Act analysis. As noted in the release, small companies, including emerging growth companies, may engage in related party transactions more frequently and therefore be exposed to incrementally higher audit costs as a result of the uh, new requirements. At the same time, if there is an increased incidence of such, trans such transactions at emerging growth companies, the risks of material misstatement in the financial statements may also be incrementally higher. Such that the new standard may provide greater investor protection in the benefits in the audits of such companies. Finding the right balance um, uh, of the burden and benefit will be a challenge, and I look forward to receiving thoughtful input on these difficult issues and on the reproposed standard and amendments in general. Closing, I'd like to join my colleagues on the board in thanking the staff and the office of the Chief Auditor, including Marty Bauman, Greg Skates, Nick Grillo, Brian Degano, and everyone else here at the uh, PCOB, uh, including members of the Office of the General Counsel and the Division of um, uh, Registration and Inspections, all of whom contributed to this important project. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the, uh, the staff of the Office of the Chief uh, Accountant at the SEC for all the assistance and guidance they've given us in this process. Thank you, Jay. Board <coughs> Member Ferguson. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to start off by uh, taking, joining my colleagues and taking the opportunity to thank our staff and the Office of the Chief Auditor and our other divisions as well as the SEC staff for your hard work on this project. When you look at the work that goes into this, you realize that it truly takes a village to uh, make one of these standards work. And I know you've all been working hard since our last open meeting about a year ago, and due to your good efforts, we're here with a much improved proposal. I strongly support the PCOB's efforts to strengthen the auditor's evaluation of related party and significant unusual transactions. These transactions, including transactions between a company and its executive officers or shareholders, and significant and unusual transactions, involve an area of the utmost importance because such transactions have too often been the sources of fraud and material misstatement in financial statements. These risks are present domestically, but we live in an ever more global economy, and we have a growing awareness that these transactions are a risk around the world, and particularly at companies in emerging markets. 
The board's original release on these, in the board's original release on these standards, we highlighted the risks, material, the special risks, material misstatement <coughs> associated with related party transactions and transactions in Asian markets arise, can, can pose, arising from different ownership structures and cultural factors characteristic to that region. As the board set forth in the 2011 practice alert on audit risks in certain emerging markets, cultural differences, the importance of family ownership structures, ties of management to governments, and spin-offs of emerging market companies from state-owned enterprises pose particular risks of fraud in the context of related party transactions. Moreover, undisclosed related party transactions may be an especially significant concern among smaller issues, either domestic or foreign, that may have only recently gone public and that may have engaged in related party transactions while still private companies. Given these risks, current disclosure regimes, particularly in emerging markets, may not in all cases be sufficiently robust when it comes to related party transactions. The Board has already imposed sanctions through settlements in connection with matters in which undisclosed related party transactions were identified as problematic in audits of foreign issuers. At this time, it's especially important that we revise the current standard to elevate the audit work performed in this critical area. The provision in the standard regarding the auditor's obligation to inform audit committees in detail about the work performed by auditors related, uh, regarding related parties is also a necessary and natural complement to the Board's current focus on improving audit quality by making efforts to reach audit committee members. The Board has identified as a near-term strategic priority an effort to enhance our outreach to and interaction with audit committees to constructively engage in areas of common interest. This effort will focus on helping audit committees improve their capacity to understand and evaluate audit quality, including through inspection reports and other reports that the BCOB repa prepares. The focus in this standard on ensuring that audit committees have the information they need to understand the audit in areas of related party relationships and transactions and significant unusual transactions will work to improve the information about or the information that audit committees receive from the auditors, which I am confident will aid audit committees in how to evaluate their auditors and audit quality more broadly. Uh, as the staff has detailed in digesting and implementing the comments received in the original proposal, we've been able to make further improvements to the proposed stand standards. And all of us on the board look forward to receiving public comments on these important standards. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Harris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, support the re-proposed auditing standard amendments that we are considering uh, this morning. Others have already clearly stated the need for board action in the audit areas being addressed. And in my statement from February 28, 2012, I discuss in some detail why I believe it is appropriate for the board to act in these areas and why these proposals are important uh, for some for investor protection. As Greg and others have pointed out, uh, the comments we received on the original proposal were generally supportive of the board's action. Uh, some commentators, however, raised concerns on certain aspects of the initial proposal. And I would like to focus and touch on those comments we received in one area in particular, uh, namely executive compensa compensation. As Nick explained and Jay as well, uh, the original proposal would have required the auditor to perform specific procedures to obtain an understanding of the company's financial relationships with its executive officers. To do this, the auditor would have been required to read the employment and compensation contracts of the company's executive officers as well as a proxy statement and other filings with the SEC. Some commentators supported the above procedures with one commenter, commenter stating that these procedures would lead to higher quality audits. Other commenters, however, asserted that such procedures could expand the auditor's role by placing the auditor in a position in which he might potentially influence the design and appropriateness of the company's compensation arrangements with its executives. The intent of the procedures in the original proposal was not to place the auditor in such a role. Rather, the intent was to enable the auditor to identify and assess risks associated with such arrangements, as well as to identify any incentives and pressures on management to commit fraud. <clears throat> Reading and understanding the terms of how the executive offices are compensated can be an important step in identifying and assessing the risks of material misstatements. I agree with commenters 
that the auditor should not be involved in assessing the appropriateness of the executive compensation structure of a company. That is something that is best left to the compensation committees or boards of companies. The reproposal addresses this concern by clarifying that these procedures are part of the auditor's risk assessment procedures and not intended to expand the auditor's role. I want to briefly touch on our rulemaking process and economic considerations and in that context commend the staff for their thoroughness in addressing the following fundamental issues. One, what is the problem that needs to be addressed? Two, what is the current baseline and how does it need to be changed? Three, what other alternatives were considered? Four, what are the benefits and costs of the proposed changes? Five, how does a proposed standard benefit investors? And six, how are they, they, they an improvement over existing standards and those of the International Auditing and Insurance Standards Board? And I think you've done an excellent job uh, in, in touching base on all of those issues. On a final note, uh, the current release is just over 200 pages. Uh, I recognize the release covers three significant areas, but I want to encourage all involved to look for ways to possibly streamline future releases. In closing, uh, I join you, Mr. Chairman, and others in thanking Marty Bauman and his staff, Greg Skates, Brian Degano, and Nick Grillo, uh, and Karen Burgess. Uh, and I want to pay a special thanks to Bob, uh, who's got an encyclopedic understanding of the securities laws, uh, going back, I think, to at least the Chairman Chad regime. Uh, and I've appreciated the benefit of your counsel over the years. I would also like to thank the staff of the SEC for the very helpful input on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We will um, we'll entertain questions, and I think we will start, as is our custom, in inverse order uh, with Board Member Harris. Any questions for the staff? Well, I must say, Mr. Chairman, I, I do now have a, a newfound appreciation for the seniority system because, in essence, when you go last, it's most difficult to say anything new. So, Jay and, and Jeanette, uh, you know, uh, it's an interesting position to be put in. So. I'm um, pleasantly surprised to see the order was switched up today. <laughs> I'm glad you were. <laughs> uh, but in any event, the, the, the chairman has referenced uh, this uh, and others have in their opening statements. But uh, to the extent that you can, uh, I wish you'd uh, provide uh, some specific examples of, of problematic auditing of uh, related party transactions, uh, significant transactions, and transactions with executive officers, uh, which led to the need uh, for this uh, proposed standard in the first place. Why don't I start by taking that question. Um, as uh, board member Jay Hansen noted, um, at, at smaller companies, oftentimes there are more related party transactions even than at larger companies. And as our inspections and some enforcement actions have noted, um, auditors have had some problems auditing these areas of related party transactions even today with the current standard that has some, some wide latitude. So um, we see problems already today in, in auditing uh, companies that have related party transactions. Um, but it's not just good enough to improve those audits. That has to be done. Those auditors that aren't complying with existing procedures have to raise the bar and do that. But there's a long history of corporate scandals regarding the types of transactions we're talking about today scandals that go bar back as far as continent continental vending that actually uh, led to the issuance of the existing standard. So, and other examples include China natural gas, which is a current problem with related party transactions noted in, noted in the release. So, so the prominence of, of major financial reporting frauds such as Enron and Tyco, which actually featured all of the critical areas we're talking about today, in terms of their, their, their financial reporting fraud, demonstrate the need for an improvement in the auditing standards above where they are today. Um, these are problematic areas, difficult to audit, and need improved auditing standards. And that's what we've done here. In addition, by, by looking at improving the auditing of related party transaction and the auditor's identification and auditing of significant unusual transactions, and the incentives that executive officers might have as a result of compensation, and putting those together in this release, we think will help the auditors connect the dots better in the auditors of these complex areas, leading to improved audit quality and better investor protection. And then could you also um, 
comment on, on the process a little bit. I, I complimented you in, in my statement on the very thoroughness uh, of, of, of the release. Um, and you're addressing, uh, for example, the baseline and how it needs to be changed, other alternatives that were considered, uh, the benefits and the costs of the proposed changes, uh, and the improvements over uh, ISIS. Uh, I think that's a you know, as I say, it's been a very thorough exercise, but if you could just touch upon a little bit the process that you went through in each of those areas, I'd appreciate it. Well, I'll start again, I think, and thank you for the, for the comments in that regard. Uh, as, as was mentioned earlier uh, by, by Board Member Ferguson and others, beginning back in early 2012, we, we determined we needed to improve our economic analysis in general <coughs> in the consideration of the issuance of standards and our public interest finding um, that was further addressed uh, after the JOBS Act. So as a result of that, we've been continuing our process working with uh, economists in the Office of Research and Analysis and economists now that we've hired uh, hopefully in the future in uh, the Office of the Chief Auditor um, will continue to help us improve this type of analysis. I, I think the problem was clear that the auditing standards in this area had to be improved. Uh, there are too many scandals uh, in areas involving related party transactions. <clears throat> there were significant and usual transactions that weren't getting proper attention from auditors, and as we said, incentives created by compensation. So I, I think uh, the identification of the problem uh, is, was clear, and I think it's articulated in the release. In considering alternatives, uh, we, we have put out some alerts in the past that address some of some of these issues, such as in significant unusual transactions. Um, so we put out practice alerts where we can, but we looked at this and said, alternatives with respect to the standard, we needed to improve the standard. There's really no other way other than improving that standard. For significant unusual transactions, we thought am amendments to existing standards, uh, AU 316 on fraud, was an appropriate alternative rather than a new standard in that area. So. Um, Considering alternatives, um, those are the types of processes we went through. Uh, then with considering uh, benefits and costs, uh, we looked at how the standard will, will benefit investors, and we've tried to analyze what types of costs could be involved. I think the standard is written in such a way, um, and the amendments that they're scalable. That is, a company that has few related party transactions, you won't see significant additional costs. A company that has related party, party transactions, but they're well, that company is well controlled, they identify those transactions, they document them well, clearly account for them and disclose them properly, you probably wouldn't see significant additional costs there either. But in a situation where the company may not identify them well, where their relationships are extensive and complex, not clearly understood even by those people in financial reporting, auditors will going to under this standard, we'll have to improve what they do and raise the bar as a result of what we're proposing here. So we've proposed a, a standard and amendments that we think are scalable to the situation and the facts and circumstances that auditors will address <coughs> in particular cases. So I think that's the type of analysis we go through in trying to perform an appropriate economic analysis. Having said that, we raise, I think, over 20 questions in the document asking for further input, empirical evidence, and further uh, information from commenters on economic consequences of the standards and amendments, as well as the uh, application of these standards to emerging growth companies. Anybody want to add further? And, 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 and finally, with respect to the last part of that, uh, you know, how do you consider these an improvement over the ICES? I want to take that, uh, Ryan. Sure. <clears throat> In, uh, in Appendix 5 to the proposing release and also in the reproposing release, we have a, an appendix which um, identifies the certain significant differences between the, the proposals and the uh, standards of the IAASB and the ASB. And I think one of the most significant differences is that, as Marty mentioned, uh, the, the reproposed standard employs a scaled approach. So there's certain basic procedures that the auditor performs for each related party transaction that requires disclosure or that the auditor believes is a significant risk and basic procedures that the auditor performs for each significant unusual transaction that the auditor identifies. From that point, the auditor then determines additional work as appropriate 
based on the particular facts and circumstances of the transaction and the company. And those basic procedures, um, the, the standards of the IAASB, they don't require the same level of basic procedures. So I think that's the most significant difference. And in thinking about those basic procedures that are required by the standard, we think that many diligent auditors are currently doing those today. So for example, one of the procedures is to read the underlying documentation regarding the related party transaction or significant usual transaction. We think auditors do, many auditors do that procedure today. Um, determining whether or not the transaction was appropriately authorized and approved. We think diligent auditors undertake that exercise today. And then considering, um, also considering whether the party has the financial capability to be in the transaction. So those are all key things that we think an auditor should be required to do for related party transactions and significant unusual transactions. And they have the potential to point the auditor to red flags if the auditor identifies problems in those areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Board member person. I have a couple of questions here. One, uh, as I looked at the economic analysis in this release, it seems that uh, you know we talk about the benefits, which I think are uh, pretty clear. We can see those. And the, the question, it seems to me, where we need more information is on uh, the costs, how what, what the costs of this proposal likely. What sort of information will you be seeking uh, in order to, to, to complete this economic analysis and in order to uh, really look at the costs of this? Well, as we've as we've indicated, and, and as you pointed out, uh, we do point out the benefits of the of the standard and how it should improve audit quality, and by doing that, hopefully improve financial reporting quality and have positive effects on uh, cost of capital and, and capital formation. Um, we've looked at the the costs. Uh, the existing standard today um, gives wide latitude to the auditor um, and how they address related party transactions, and and we think that uh, is too judgmental. And as such, we, we've included, as Brian indicated, procedures that have to be performed. Um, now, again, I've said, as I said before, we think they're scalable depending upon what you find that will extend your procedures, including the processes and controls at a company, which will affect that. We want to get more information from auditors and from preparers about these matters. Um, about the facts and circumstances that they see and that they deal with and provide us with evidence of how these standards will, will work and to what extent they will increase costs or to what extent companies understand that if they improve their controls and processes around these, they could help contain these costs by giving the auditor appropriate information and documentation that the auditor can, can see and follow that trail. Um, so, so we're looking for some empirical data. We're looking for views. Um, with respect to emerging growth companies as required by the JOBS Act, we've laid out a description of what we understand about emerging growth companies today, um, who they are and what they look like. Uh, we're looking for both those emerging growth companies and their auditors to advise us, are there differences there that we should take into account as to whether or not this standard should apply to the audits of emerging growth companies or not? So uh, there's a lot of information. We'll st we think we have a lot of information, but we'd like a lot more data, empirical data, to help us finalize this analysis when we bring this before the board as an adopting release for this for the standard to go final. And when you say empirical data, do you mean I some quantitative data, for example, how much more time it requires to, uh, to, to do the analysis that this standard would require over what would have been required before? That like would that. be very helpful if auditors looked at particular audits that they had where there were extensive related party transactions, and how much more time would that take them to right. perform under this standard compared to what they were doing in the past under the existing standards. So that would be very helpful information for us. Okay, the second question I have has to do with, uh, this is the second time this proposal has been out. We've received a lot of comments. What specific areas are you asking for comment on? What specifically do you want to hear further from commenters or that are areas where you think we, we still want to hear from people? Well, the first thing we want to hear from commenters is that we did a good job in responding to their... <laughs> so you want praise. <laughs> That's exactly the point. We want, we want to hear that uh, hopefully we did a good job in responding to the many good comments that came in in the initial proposal. They were good comments. They pointed out uh, that the standard in general was an improvement over the existing uh, standard, but there were areas where we could enhance it further and clarify further. So we do want to hear, hopefully, that we've done that. Uh, hopefully we hear that... Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good auditing standard that, in fact, will improve audit quality to the extent that we've indicated we think it will. 
And as I said before, we want to get more information primarily around economic consequences of the standard. I mean, that's really what we're hoping to hear from, from commenters. Primarily about economic analysis. <clears throat> primarily. That's correct. Uh, a, a couple questions. Um, it's been noted that uh, before that we have um, uh, a near-term initiative about our outreach to uh, audit committees, and the, and the standard uh, does um, uh, put some additional um, uh, communication requirements uh, on the auditor that effectively amend the standard we just put out last um, uh, last year on uh, uh Communications with audit committees, and and maybe you could just get some more color commentary around what we really think that the additional requirements of uh, of of this proposal relative to um, auditors' communication with the audit committee about related party transactions. What what's it really hoping to accomplish? Right. Well, uh, similar to AS sixteen, this proposal before you reproposal before you today, what it does is uh, it. Uh, it has incentive for the auditor to communicate and have a two-way communication with the audit committee. <laughs> and it starts early on with the auditor inquiring of the audit committee about their understanding of the related party transactions and any significant unusual transactions. And it also, also the auditor would inquire of the audit committee about any concerns they might have about any related <coughs> party, uh, parties or related party transactions they have. And so it starts early on with the audit committee, and then uh, towards the end of the audit, when the auditor has carried out their uh, audit procedures in this area and other area aspects of the audit, then the auditor will come to the audit committee, and then they will inform the audit committee their evaluation of the company's identification, accounting for, and disclosure of those related party transactions. And that, that could include... Uh, if there were some business uh, uh, purposes that they had some concerns about with those related, related related parties, then if they had concerns about that, then they would bring that, the auditors would bring that up to the audit committee at that time. Also, they if they had any related parties or related party transactions that were undisclosed and they identified during the audit, then that would be, of course, be a serious matter that would be also be communicated to the audit committee. So it's a... It's a robust discussion starting early on and, and towards the end of the audit, and they're going to wrap it up and, and, and inform the audit committee, make sure the audit committee is adequately informed about all their findings in this area. I'd just like to expand on that just a tiny bit, and that was a very good reply, but I, I just want to make sure that uh, auditors recognize that even under Auditing Standard 16, which you referenced, uh, Jay, that uh, was just issued by, by the board last year, um, Although related party transactions are not specifically referenced in AS16, auditors have a responsibility to discuss with audit committees significant risks as part of the audit, and that's often related party transactions. They have a responsibility to discuss significant accounting issues, significant estimates. Uh, those are They could be related to related party transactions. Um, they have a responsibility um, already to discuss with the audit committee any other matters arising from the audit that are significant to the oversight of the audit of the audit committee's uh, financial oversight of the financial reporting process. So there's plenty within AS16 today that, uh, in my view, if there are material related party transactions, um, auditors should be communicating those. But the new proposal, reproposal here, makes specific requirements that the auditor should communicate their evaluation about identification of related party transactions and accounting and disclosure for them, as well as some of the exceptions they find in the audit that, that Greg just discussed. Also, with respect to significant unusual transactions, AS16 had specific requirements in that for auditors to discuss significant unusual transactions, including their understanding of the business rationale for those. So, so there's robust communication requirements with audit committees that are very important. We think that's a, a critical area of improving audit quality. AS16 did that, and this just further enhances that dialogue with the audit committee. Okay. Well, one um, um, last question, and that's in, in the um, uh, lengthy release that uh, some of my fellow board members have, have observed, there's lots of information in there, and in the economic analysis um, discussion, there's uh, a concept called information asymmetry. And not being an economist uh, and, uh, and not uh, um, uh, being terribly steeped in, uh, in this concept of information asymmetry, could you uh, uh, expand a little bit on, on what, 
what are we talking about, and and how is that relevant to the uh, economic analysis uh, discussion? I'll start it off, and then uh, maybe Brian can join in. But uh, the, the reproposing release notes that information asymmetry refers to situations involving separate parties in which one party, let's say management, has more information or better information than other parties, let's say either an audit committee or, or investors, th third parties outside the company. So having more information inside the company about transactions uh, than investors outside have about material uh, risks creates information asymmetry. Um, this can this can cause a problem for investors in terms of a lack of confidence if they don't believe they uh, have the necessary information to make an evaluation of the risks of material misstatement in the financial statements. Let's just take one of the most prominent cases, Enron, for example. Management had great understanding of these off-balance sheet joint ventures where the CFO was involved in the joint ventures and there was significant interaction uh, between the company and the joint ventures, such as JEDI and Chuco, which at the end of the day resulted in significant drain of funds out of Enron. Management had great understanding of that. The footnotes had modest disclosure of those related party transactions, and investors didn't understand those risks to the same degree. That's a perfect example of the information asymmetry that can be caused. This standard, hopefully, by improving audit quality and improving the auditor's attention to the identification of the transactions, the accounting for those transactions, and the disclosure of those transactions should result in improved financial reporting quality about those related party transactions, reducing that information asymmetry, getting the same important information to investors that management has about significant risks. But, but just to be clear, we're not imposing any new disclo disclosure requirements on management. We don't have that authority. Yeah, we're, improving, we're improving the audit quality about the auditing of those accounting and auditing those disclosures so that those disclosures present the financial statements appropriately and fairly and present the risks appropriately and fairly. Okay, thanks. Board Member Frenzel. Throughout the discussion, we've heard about uh, differences in auditor performance in these areas. Uh, some auditors are not following current standards. Other auditors are doing more than what's required, and we're thinking that in other cases, this may not be a big change uh, for auditors. Uh, we've also heard about the differences between smaller companies and larger companies in terms of how they use related party transactions. Uh, so it strikes me that um, the, the impact on different audits and different firms is going to be very different uh, depending on the starting point. Uh, how are we going to consider this uh, in the economic analysis and the cost-benefit considerations? we we'll start, Brian? Sure. Well, as you said, um, the, the existing standard allows the auditors a wide latitude in, in auditing uh, related party transactions and significant unusual transactions. Um, what what the proposal is trying to do is, is to raise the auditor's um, basic procedures in these areas. Um, it, many of the auditors out there today are performing these basic procedures um, and our economic analysis is just seeking more feedback on what the expected costs could be uh, in those areas. Um, I, think, um, I think that's a key point. Um, because of the wide latitude in the existing standards, um, as we indicated, some auditors aren't even performing up to that level, and we've noted that in board and inspection reports and general reports. Um, so we're going to hopefully raise the minimum level to, to a common threshold here for, for all of the audits. Some auditors are exceeding, exceeding that today. So therefore, uh, you know, part of the economic analysis does not contemplate those auditors who are not, who are not performing appropriate audit procedures today. They need to raise the bar to get up to that level. Um, but certainly, we are proposing new requirements and additional requirements that we believe are appropriate in these areas with significant risks of material misstatement, related parties, unusual transactions, and relationships with uh, financial executives. <coughs> uh, we've said they're scalable, <coughs> depending upon the facts and circumstances in the company. Um, and our economic analysis lays some of that out. But basically, Jeanette, we're looking for more information from commenters that can really help us uh, better understand the impact of the standard, uh, its benefits, and, and certainly uh, the costs of its application. 
yeah, I, I think this will be interesting when we get the results in. I don't think we're going to get letters from firms saying this is going to be especially expensive for us because we're performing at a very low level. So we're going to have to really <laughs> sort through uh, and analyze uh, the input that we get. Um, and I agree that bringing everybody to at least a more consistent level is very important here. Um, can you explain about the time frames that you're looking at for finalizing this standard and when you think it might become effective? The uh, the proposed proposal before you today would uh, be effective for fiscal years beginning on or after December fifteenth, two thousand thirteen. But what we'll do though is you know we've been talking about the uh, request for comments with respect to the economic considerations. So we're going to have to wait and see when the you know what the comments how they come in, and to see uh, what if anything we need to do with respect to the reproposal before you today. So that's going to you know could impact us and could impact our timeline as far as the effective date. So uh, we would, uh, so we'll have to take that into consideration uh, as we move forward and as we just get the comments in and discuss them with the board and see what we want to do with those uh, comments. And do you have plans for assessing and measuring the impact of this standard? It seems like this standard has great potential for raising audit quality. Um, how will we determine that? Well, as we've done with other standards that we've um, issued recently, uh, we work very close in, closely with our um, inspections division as they inspect audits. And, and recently, they've been looking at uh, AS5 and internal controls. Then after that, AS7 on engagement quality reviews, and now going into um, the risk assessment standards. Um, inspections gives us great feedback as they look at audits to determine how our auditors applying the new requirements. First of all, are they complying with them? But but how are they requiring? Uh, how are they complying with them? Uh, but also, uh, hopefully, getting impact input from inspectors in terms of what they're seeing in terms of effort that's being expended with respect to these standards, and is it consistent with what we thought about its scalability, et, et cetera, based on the facts and circumstances? Um, we'll all we'll also, as part of our ongoing econ economic analysis, consider and I don't have the answer to this, but further ways to look at standards after we issue them to what, make sure we understand the impact of those standards. I think that's an ongoing process for us to continue to work on and improve. That's all I have. Thank you. Well, this meeting is uh, almost exactly one hour old, and I believe the board is ready to vote. Will all in favor of the reproposal please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. It is approved. Thank you to the Office of the Chief Auditor and all of you who have been mentioned. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. We will reconvene as a, uh, as a closed meeting. Why don't we give ourselves 10 minutes and reconvene at 2011. Thank you.